This week we learning Parsha Emor, which means speak. First, um, a little bit of the content of this Parsha, and then we will go a little bit deeper on one little topic which is covered in that Parsha. The Torah portion Emor begins with special laws relevant to the Kahanim, the priests, and the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, as well as it covers the temple service. The coin may not become ritually impure through contact to a dead body, which means he cannot be under the same roof with the corpse of a person even during the funeral, except on occasion of death of a close relative. A coin may not marry a divorcee or a woman of promiscuous past, a coin gadol can marry only a virgin, and a coin with physical deformity cannot serve in the holy temple, nor can he, nor can a deformed animal be brought as an offering. A newborn calf, lamb, or a kid must be left with its mother for seven days, and only under, after the eighth day it may become eligible for a sacrifice offering. As well as uh, the other limitation is one may not slaughter the animal and its offspring on the same day, which is covered in this parsha. The second part of the war lists the annual festivals of Jewish calendar. The weekly Shabbat, the seventh day, uh, which is probably the most important festival of Jewish life because we, uh, we follow, we celebrate Shabbat, we, we relax on Shabbat uh, every week. Then Passover festival beginning on the 15th of Nisan, um, the beginning of Amer counting on the second day of Passover, culminating in the festival of Shavuot, which is receiving of the Torah, uh, then we have the uh, remembrance of blowing the shofar on the first of Tishrei, which is Rosh Hashanah, and ten days later Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, on the tenth of Tishrei. And then there is the Sukkot festival, during which we are to dwell in the huts for seven days, which begins on the fifteenth of Tishrei and it's immediately followed by the eighth day of Sukkot, which is called Shmini Atzeret. Then the parsha uh, discusses the lighting of menorah in the temple, as well as the um, process of putting the show bread lechem, hapanim, uh, on the table there in the temple. The parsha more concludes with the incident of a man executed for blasphemy, and the penalties for murder or death and for injuring one's fellow or destroying his property, normally resulting in monetary compensation. And basically that's what the Parsha is all about. Well, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in his articles brings an interesting concept related to this Torah portion. Uh, there is something very strange about the festival of Sukkot, for which a more this parsha is the primary source, which is where we told we must celebrate Sukkot. On one hand, it is a festival of su uh, supremely associated with joy. It is the only festival in our parsha that mentions actually rejoicing. This is what it says. And you shall rejoice before the God, your God, for seven days on Sukkot. In the Torah as a whole, joy is not mentioned at all in relation to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, or Pesach. Once only it's mentioned in connection with Shavuot, receiving the Torah, and three times it's mentioned in connection with Sukkot. And hence the other name for Sukkot is Zman Simchatenu, the festival of joy. 
Yet what it recalls is one of the more negative elements or histories of the uh, Jewish life in wilderness years. Look what it says. You shall live in a booth for seven days. All citizens in Israel shall live in a booth so that the future generations may know that I made the Israelites live in the booth when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 23, 42 and 43. For 40 years, Israelites lived without permanent homes, often on the move. They were in the wilderness, in no man's land at all, where it's hard to know what to expect and what dangers await for them along the way. To be absolutely truthful, the, the people lived under protection divine protection and uh, the so-called clouds of glory. We will come to that in a few seconds. But they could never be sure in advance anyway what is forthcoming, in what shape, in what form the protection will manifest itself. And obviously for 40 years they lived with prolonged period of insecurity and most definitely uncertainty. So why Sukkot, of all festivals, is called Zmanim Simchateinu, the festival of joy? It would have made it would make much more sense to call Pesach, for instance, the freedom, the birthday of our freedom, as the festival of joy. It would make more sense to call Shavuot. Uh, and the festival of joy, the day of revelation at Sinai and receiving the Torah. But why give that title to a festival that commemorate, com commemorates 40 years of exposure to heat, heat, to cold, wind, rain, all elements, right? Remembering, being, and, and, and it says, remembering that why you should, you know, why we should feel joy with all of this. Besides which, what was the miracle? Pesach and Shavuot recall miracles. But traveling through the wilderness with only a temporary dwelling, temporary home, was neither miraculous or, or unique at all. That is what people who travel through wilderness basically do. They live in a hut or a tent or something like this. You know, this is what they must do when they are on a journey. They can only have temporary dwelling anyway. In this respect, there was nothing special about the Israelites' experience in there, in the desert for 40 years. It was this consideration that led Rabbi Ishmael to suggest that the Sukkah represents the, actually the clouds of glory. Ananeini Kavod. Ananeini Kavod proper pronunciation. I'm still learning my Hebrew. That accompanied the Israelites during those years. Sheltering from them heat um, and the cold and protecting them from their enemies and uh, guiding them on the way and even uh, washing their clothes and adjusting the size of it by miracle um, uh, while the kids are growing, for instance. This is a beautiful and imaginative solution to the problem why joy is attributed to the festival of Sukkot. But it's difficult to accept nonetheless. A Sukkah looks nothing like a cloud of glory. The connection between Sukkah and clouds of glory comes not from the Torah, but from the book of Isaiah, referring to not to the past actually, but to the future. I think it's maybe to our time. And this is what it says. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount of, of all of Mount Zion, and over those who assemble there, a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. A canopy. It will be a sukkah for shade from heat by day, and a shelter, a hiding place from the storm and rain. Rabbi Akiva 
actually disagree, disagrees with Rabbi Ishmael's view and says that sukkah is what it is. It's a, it's a hut. It's a sukkah. It's a booth. It's a temporary dwelling. Nothing more and nothing less. So what, according to Rabbi Akiva, was the miracle in that case? There is no way of knowing exactly the answer. But we can guess some of it. If a sukkah represents the clouds of glory, which is the view of Rabbi Ishmael, then it celebrates God's miracle. If it represents nothing other than a sukkah itself, which is Rabbi Akiva's view, then it celebrates the human miracle, of which Jeremiah spoke when he said, Thus said the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. Yes, he refers to the Jews going into the desert. The Israelites may have complained and rebelled in the desert, but they followed God. They kept going like Abraham and like Sarah. They were prepared to journey into the unknown. If you understand this to be the miracle, we can rediscover a very deep truth about faith itself. Faith is not certainty. Faith is the courage to live with uncertainty. Exactly what the whole humanity is experiencing right now. Almost every phase of Exodus was constant struggle with all sorts of difficulties, real or imagined. That is what makes the Torah so powerful. It does not pretend that life is easy and, you know, the way is, everything is hunky-dory every time. The road is not straight and the journey is long. Unexpected things do happen. Crises suddenly appear. Don't we know about it? It becomes important to embed in our people's memory the knowledge that we can handle the unknown. God is with us, giving us the courage we need. Sukkot is a testament to the Jewish people's survival. Even if Jewish nation loses its land and it's and is cast again into the wilderness, God forbid. It will lose neither her heart or hope. It will remember that it spent its early years as a nation living in a sukkah, a temporary dwelling exposed to all the elements. It will know that in the wilderness, no encampment is permanent. It will keep on traveling until once again it reaches the promised land, Israel, home. It is no accident that we, the Jewish people, is the only ethnic group that have survived for 2,000 years of exile, dispersion, pogroms, with its identity intact and energy unabated. We are the only people who can live in a shack with leaves above our heads as a roof and yet feel that we are surrounded by clouds of glory. We are the only people who can live in a temporary dwelling and yet rejoice. Sukkot is about uncertainty. It tells us that we can know everything else, but we will never know what tomorrow brings. Time is a journey across the wilderness. On Rosh Hashanah and Kippur we pray to be written in the book of life. On Sukkot, we rejoice because we believe we have received a positive answer to our prayers. But as we turn the face to the coming year, we acknowledge at the outset that life is fragile, vulnerable, in a dozen different ways. Right now, the whole humanity, including us Jews, does not know what our health will be what our career or livelihood will be, or what will happen to society and to the whole world after all this pandemic will be over. We cannot escape the exposure to risk. That is what 
life is all about. The Sukkah symbolizes living with unexpected, with, with the unpredictability of it. Sukkot is the festival of radical uncertainty. It tells us that, through, that though we journey through wilderness, we as people will reach our destination regardless. If we see life through the eyes of faith, we will know we are surrounded by the clouds of glory. Amid uncertainty, we will find ourselves to be able to rejoice. We need no castles for protection of our, or of our protection or palaces for our glorification. A humble sukkah will do. For when we sit within it, we sit beneath what Zahar calls the shade of faith under the umbrella of Hashem. Shabbat Shalom.